Welcome, Jay Clayton. Well, howdy. Nice to be here. The first question I always start with is, what was the role of music in your childhood? My parents were both singers. They did what you now would call karaoke back before it was karaoke. They didn't have like the screen that had lyrics on it. They had just a book that they had written the lyrics out for, and then they had, you could buy backing tracks uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s that were made here in Nashville that were basically like the tracking session of a particular song without the vocal. Oh, okay. And so they could sing Chattahoochee by Alan Jackson and have the track sound pretty close to it. So I used to go to a lot of their shows. So music was always something that for me meant like a party or meant an engagement of some sorts, you know, whether it was, you know, people getting together in a bar or them playing a wedding reception or a birthday party or or anything like that. So music was always in my childhood and kind of was, you know, one of those connecting points that, again, meant party or fun. So that's what we try to bring to all of our shows when we do music as well is to, you know, bring that party atmosphere and situation to wherever we're at. And when did the switch happen for you to see music? I mean, you still see it as a party of fun, <laughs> obviously. Let's yeah. be clear. Yes. Um, but when did it become, hey, this could be my career. This could be a job. Well, I, I was playing music as a job before I come to Nashville. I was in a couple of different bands. And one of the bands in particular was uh, named TNT and the Dynamite Cowboys. And they were a fantastic group. It was a husband and wife team, Tim and Tammy. So they were called TNT, and when they wanted a band put together, some friends and fans suggested, you know, what goes with TNT? Dynamite. So Dynamite Cowboys were born. And that's a band I was in before I come to Nashville, and I was making, you know, a pretty good living playing with them. And we were playing multiple venues, but this one venue particularly uh, was called Nashville North in Taylorville, Illinois, and we were the house band. So every major act that would come through to play a show TNT and the Dynamite Cowboys would open for them. And so I saw several of the same managers and road managers and tour managers that would come through with multiple artists over and over and over again over three or four years. And they started, you know, talking me into coming down here. And when you get people from a business town that are talking to you and trying to lure you to their town, that's when you start realizing it is more than just like a hobby, which I always knew it was going to be more than a hobby. But that's when it became serious. It's like, okay, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life to support myself. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of when it was, when the managers and stuff for the national acts that were coming through started talking to me. That's when I kind of knew it was time to make the move. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're talking is the new record. Yes, ma'am. And the first single off of that, the What Not To Do, Mm -hmm. um, which is... The type of advice I tend to dispense. Yeah. <laughs> More than do this. It's like, don't, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, but what I think is so cool about that song is it, it sort of touches on two things. One, the kind of writing that I really like, where where you get an enormous amount of material just in those you know few minutes, and then the storytelling that back to that. That's what country music made famous. You know the storytelling aspect, and you guys crammed three stories. In, into yeah. the songs, well, crammed, you know, sure. tally, <laughs> three stories into this. Uh, to talk a little about the writing process of, of a song like that, from from almost the technical point of the decision to, to tell it from three stories rather than follow one character and how that played in the room to get that, that together. Well, um, the song idea to me, before it was ever, like, lyrically written, was just a, a instrumental idea that I had that I was putting together with guitar and fiddle. It was like an instrumental, just this uh, repetitive little lick that I had that I'd come up with. And um, so that was kind of something that I was just playing around with. And then uh, a buddy of uh, mine and one of the co-writers of the song was coming in and was spending some time with us, just hanging out uh, for the weekend, uh, just coming to town to write with us. And he had this idea in his notebook, and all it said was what not to do. And so we were just thinking about all kinds of you know things like, well, what... What are, what are things that you're not you know, supposed to do? And so then we started talking about our own family lives. 
and distant family members of ours. And uh, one of the writers, Al Gibson, as he says on Twitter all the time when he signs something for us is, thanks for bailing me out of jail. Like he was one of the characters that went to jail. So uh, my nephew is currently in prison right now. So uh, the whole first verse of that song was written kind of verbatim for what happened to my nephew, uh, one of the other co-writers, like cousin or something close relative, and then a mix of Al, the other writer, who had actually gone through all of this. So when we sit down with that, you know, I always like to give as much information in a song as I possibly can until you get to that point where it becomes too much information about one particular subject. You start repeating things. So we kind of decided to do it three different verses that all had the same chorus, you know, like, thanks for the lesson, thanks for the time, which is jail time. The time. The time, yeah. (laughs) Thanks for living your life of crime, you know. So all the stuff, you know, basically like crime is one of those things that it's like, it's very kind of, you know, black and white. Here's things that you shouldn't do because look at the outcome. So that was kind of the writing process for the song. It started out as like a fiddle and guitar riff that we had almost a bluegrassy train beat kind of thing. And then when we saw his idea of what not to do, it just really kind of, it it was like the ideas were written together on two separate parts of the country Mm -hmm. because Al lives in Virginia Beach. You know, we both live here in Nashville, the other two writers. So two separate places kind of had the same concept come up and they went hand in hand together. And that's kind of how the song came about. And then after the first verse, we just started ripping stories out of headlines just from right back and forth for, you know, the rest of the stuff. So it, uh, it started as a fiddle and guitar instrumental. And then uh, with the idea what not to do in a notebook, that that's what sparked the life into it from being an instrumental into being a, a vocal lyrical piece. Yeah, a story. Mm-hmm. And if I remember correctly, um, yeah. you you mentioned when we first talked they that desire to write, you know the kind the cliche, you know, write what you know, sure, um, and and stick to that. How have you watched yourself develop as a songwriter, from primarily being a musician or being known as a musician here in town, but at the same time, you know, keep developing that writing. How have you seen yourself develop, and what were the influences on that development? Well, I tell you, you know, like when you when you listen to radio, radio right now has some really cool stuff out there, whether, you know, people want to talk about what they like or what they don't like. You know, the lyrical content to a lot of stuff is still pretty strong with what's out there. You have a lot of great writers and, uh, you know, it it's ingrained into everybody's head, you know, what a good song is versus what a bad song is. Now, the difference between good and great, that's a whole other conversation that we'll have to have <laughs> later. But, you know, like... Um, as songwriting goes, it's just like anything else. I mean, you it's hard to really pinpoint, you know, when it happens. But like when you first start riding a bike, you know, you, you pick it up rather quickly and then you get really good as, as things go along. And it's really the same with writing and finding those particular people that you really like to write with and that you click with. You know, because there's some writers that you, you may really, really want to write with. And then you have a writing session with them. And it just isn't clicking. It just isn't going right. So that is a big part of it as well. It's just making sure that you're with the right people to help you evolve. Because sometimes you can, you know, get with not the right people and you could devolve if you, mm-hmm. you know, how right. you, however you want to phrase that. But it's, uh, you know, it, it's really that thing of just being able to uh, keep going and know that not every song that you write is going to be a number one song. That doesn't mean don't don't write that. Don't write it. You know, continue to write stuff, fulfill an idea till its end. Let it go. There's stuff that I write and I'm like, oh my God, that's horrible. But my rule is just put it away and come back to it. And then, you know, two weeks later, you push play on the on your computer to hear the song back in Pro Tools. And it's like, okay, well, why didn't I like that a couple weeks ago? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's just following that, that whole pattern, you know, and, and seeing what it is. Just write the material, put it down let it go. You know, I mean, not every song is going to be a hit, but, you know, keep writing. You're going to get one eventually. You touched on an interesting point, writing with the right people for you. Mm -hmm. So you could be put in a room with, you know, Mr. Big Songwriter, whomever, with 20 number one hits, but it might not be right fit for you. 
what do you think determines whether somebody is the right songwriting partner for you? Well, it's, it's you. Your chemistry is going to determine. I mean, you can't expect to go into somebody else and expect them to carry the whole writing session. Everybody has to come in with their own ideas and, and with something and be able to have an input, in my opinion, when, when you write with people. you know, And you can tell right off the bat how things are going to go, and it all goes back to you. How easily can you switch gears? You know, like... Uh, you could be a 35-year-old guy that gets a writing appointment with a 24-year-old girl. You know, there's a lot of things that you're obviously not going to have in common with each other. So you're going to have to be able to make, you're both going to have to figure out what's a middle ground and, and you know, make that work for both of you. So you can't necessarily say, well, this person isn't going to be right for me. It's like, well, no, it's, you're not right for that person. You know, sometimes you got to think, what are you doing wrong about the writing instead of just... What is somebody else doing wrong? I mean, you have to be able to to expand out of your comfort zone to get something new, or why write, write with somebody? I mean, if you could do it all yourself and you got all the answers, and, exactly. you know, why why work with somebody? Right yeah, so right. you just have to be open, you know, to yeah. to somebody else's energy. And then if you are open and it's still not working, then I think you'll you'll know it pretty quick. Yeah, so and then it's awkward. Th- then it's very <laughs> awkward. Yeah. Because then it's, and let's break for lunch. Right. And nice to see you. Yeah. Making the the record as a whole, that whole mm-hmm. process, because, again, as we previously talked about, within Nashville, you're mainly known as a musician. Yes, ma'am. Um, stepping into that studio and going, well, now I'm, you know, I'm running the show, <laughs> and this is my, my name on the record. What was, what was your thinking? What did you want to say with this record? Well, for me... When I create music with my producer and other writers, I like music first and foremost. Like, you know, you can hear a song on the radio and before the artist even opens their mouth to sing, you can pretty much determine whether you're going to like it just from hearing the opening of the song. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, because, you know, so many times on radio you hear an intro to the song and people change the channel before anything just because they know already what it is if it's not fitting their mood so when we create this when we created this album our whole thing again is about bringing a party atmosphere so when you listen to our music we wanted to bring the up-tempo life of the party aspect to the music i played all the instruments on the recording except for the drums and there's a few parts Uh, my producer rob daniels did a couple of guitar solos uh in a few different places and uh, my live drummer played on a couple of tracks, but all the rest of the instruments that are on the recordings is all me. So I kind of had, as you were saying, the ultimate control over what I wanted right. to, to, to be in the forefront as opposed to the back. And I, I really like aggression in, in music. You know, I really feel like that is energy. You know, like when, when sometimes songs can be, you know, sleepy. You know, it's you know not that necessarily there's a bad thing, but. Just it's for, not your thing. It's not my thing. You know, again, I like to bring the party. So, you know, that's with, with our music when we were s- selecting, you know, what the drums needed to sound like. Uh, the majority of the drums on the album is Troy Laquetta from the multi-platinum selling rock band Tesla. So we wanted a really big, thick rock drum sound, and that's what we went for. And with the uh, with the guitars, we went for the same thing, like a really heavy, modern, in-your-face guitar tone. So that, you know, you had the rock element there of the drums and guitar. And then we took and just twanged the whole rest of the album, all the little spaces together with fiddles and banjos and dobros and mandolins and dulcimers and any other twangy thing we could find just to to fill it up and, and bring across the country element of it because, you know, my voice is more of a uh, very stylized type of voice. You know, it's, it's its own thing. It's not meant for everybody. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, so that's the types of instruments that we put around it as well, you know, kind of dictated how my voice was going to sound for the song. And, you know, that's just what we wanted to create was a up-tempo, lively, aggressive album that you could listen to if you like country music, and you could listen to it if you like alternative or rock music, you could listen to it as well. So it's right. kind of got best of both worlds for, for all the listeners. Mm-hmm. One phrase you just used, it's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I think when you do anything creative, if you try to make something that's for everybody, you stop being creative. Uh, sure. Uh, so how do you view that that process of 
the balance between because we do live in a reality like if you're going to make a product you want to it needs to connect with someone hopefully yeah. so where do you place that balance of doing what you want to do keeping in mind that there is a market that you have to somehow keep in the back of sure. your mind but still not going all the way over there and making something only for the market where where does that balance fall for you well, again, um, the balance for me kind of came with us playing a whole bunch of shows over the past couple of years prior to releasing this album, because uh, probably about a third of the album uh, that we have just you know released and recorded, about a third of that music we've been doing for the past couple of years live. Right. So we kind of knew what the fan base was for it by just seeing how you know, the crowd reacts every night. You know, we're on a, a stage and we can see almost every person in there. And, you know, if you if you start a song that you think is awesome and you look to the bar and all the people are turning around when you start it and just going <laughs> to start talking to the, to the server, that's a problem. Right. So you kind of start seeing what you need to do. And then once we got what we wanted and it worked for the party crowd, then that's when we, I mean, that's what we wanted to begin with. So the whole, you know, lead up to this album, we kind of tested it, tried it, made sure it was working for the crowd that we wanted it to work for mm -hmm. before we, you know, actually laid it to tape and <laughs> recorded it. Yeah. So then so. you get that exact split between this is what we want to say and it's still connecting with them. But yes. it sounds like it's that perfect split. Like rather than stepping on stage going, we'll do whatever you want. Or we only do what we want. Yeah. It sounds like the experience of road testing yes. gave you that exact balance. It did, you know, because uh, crowds and audiences and fans are, are very, very honest. And because, you know, ultimately we make the music for them, you know, and it's mm -hmm. their choice to decide whether they like it or not. And if they want to choose to listen to your music versus, you know, music next yeah. so that's kind of yeah. on on the fans but you know it, it it's one of those things that i i really feel that over the past couple of years us being out and playing we have kind of found who is our audience and we've also found who our audience is at the same time not just oh, that's good. you know yeah, that yeah. that has been the thing for us is is Finding and putting things that work for everybody in your song without sacrificing the creativity that makes it for everybody. Yes. You know, it, we kind of do do what we like and what we expect to hear and then test that and see how close what we think is the mark versus what an audience thinks is the mark. Yeah. So again, it's all been uh, road tested, audience tested, and you know, it's, what ended up on the album is what we play every night, note for note. Yep. So. I, I kind of want to cheer that answer. That's so good. <laughs> um, the... A topic we, we talked about before is for yourself, if you build a career in music in any way, whether you are a producer or a manager or a different type of musician in any way and you get successful at it, the safe choice is to stay right there. Mm -hmm. You didn't take that safe choice. You went, I, I can still do that, but I'm also going to do my own thing. Talk about that. The, the, the desire to not just take the safe road. Well, uh, you know, it, it is a very, very deep-rooted desire, as you pointed out, to not, to not do what's safe, um, simply because that's kind of the way I am. You know, like, I, I know when I'm playing for a particular artist that I'm playing what's on their album. I am going to be who they need on stage at that time. Mm -hmm. But when you take, you know, the leash and the bridle off of me and let me be who I want to be, that's you know, pushing the envelope, the boundary. That's that's my music. It's outside the box. It always has been, you know. Um, so it, it's it's me, plain and simple. I mean, th this album is what I feel weird not talking directly to the to the camera, but <laughs> yeah, 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 it's awesome. yeah. Where am I looking? But it's it. You know, that that's the majority of of the music and, and the energy that that comes with the spirit of not wanting to be like everybody else. Is you know, I'm not like everybody else, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with everybody else. It's just that, you know, I want to be who I am because right. I, I, I'm having a good time with it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, another musician who was a sideman for a long time and then went on to his own career, he actually said to me, he goes, I'm, I, I almost think that it should be, it's a school, it's going to college. Like spending those years with 
in his case, you know, just like yourself, like some major country artists and having that experience before it's all on your shoulders? Oh, of course. So you can see everything. You're still playing arenas with 10,000 people, but it's not all on you. Yep. You have the same experience without that pressure. It prepares you better for when that pressure shows up. Do you? Oh, I completely, I see it as, as, uh, like before being the guy up front, it was pretty much like you're playing a video game every night. I mean, (laughs) the pressure is not on you. You know, the band's going to be fine. You're at a professional level. You know, your instruments are mostly going to be fine. And then other than that, it's just go out and have fun. And like I said about a video game, you know, like when you're playing a, a car game and you wreck the car, it just resets and then you go on again. You know, it's right. you don't have to deal with it. And that's kind of the way it is when you're playing behind an artist is that, you know, it's it's their game. They're the ones that have to deal with everything else. You're just back here kind of just having a good time and enjoying 10,000 people that are going like this yeah. looking back at you. So that's the difference between, you know, playing a game, a simulator, and then actually being yeah. in the driver's seat. It's a yeah, completely... The, to be the person who... Signs the checks and oh yeah, and, and you can wreck this car any second, and it doesn't just jump right back on the road again. You know? <laughs> Conversely, yeah, putting your own show on the road mm-hmm. and you know doing the the administration for the band and sure. dealing with the bus company and uh, dealing with booking agents and awesome publicists. And yes, all of these different things. How does that? How naturally is that part of the music business? How, how naturally does that come to you? It doesn't. Playing as many instruments as I have and working for how many people I have, I've learned to be very, very flexible and be able to adapt. Mm -hmm. This, the whole business side of music, being the music business, doesn't come naturally to me at all. But so does all kinds of other stuff that I do. So I'm having to to be able to adapt and roll with the punches. But the musical side of something, you know, we we talked earlier in the interview about how did the business side of it become the forefront, Mm -hmm. you know, and what I want to do for a living. Because when you decide to do it for a living, it does become a business. But when I started playing music at like 13 years old, there was, I mean, money did not even come into the equation, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's what music was for me all along and and still to this day is, is something I would want to do whether I was paid for it or not. And so that, again, is, you know, like a big part, you know, of it is you, you can't lose that even though you do have to, you know, get paid to do your shows because, as you pointed out, you have everything else that you have, you know, that has to keep it going between fuel for the vehicles and and band members and everything else that goes along with it. So you you do have to be compensated, but at the same time, you know, music has always been something that that I would do regardless, you know, whether whether it was a job or a hobby. Right. And I'm I'm trying this new thing. Um, In the tradition of people like uh, Bernard Pivot and James Lipton is to... Shoot this little questionnaire at okay. people right at the end. And see how this goes. <laughs> what is your favorite word? My favorite word? Hypothesis. That is my favorite word. And what is your least favorite word? Oh, least favorite word. No. What is your favorite sound? The violin. And your least favorite sound? Well, to me, it would. I'm, I'm not a big fan of of the sound of like really loud brass instruments, and not any one of them in particular, but just like really loud. And it could even be like really loud cymbals, or like a gong or something. I think that really kind of freaks me out. <laughs> <laughs> what do you feel is your main characteristic? My main characteristic to me that I try to portray to everybody is just positivity. And what would be a character trait you would want to improve? Positivity. This is an interesting question. Right? What is your favorite swear word? My favorite swear word. Wow. I don't know. They all just so freely come out of my mouth on a daily basis. I don't know how to how to lay one down. I don't. I don't know. I don't necessarily know that there is a favorite. It's all of them. Uh, yeah, I. I grew up in a very, very loose uh, family, so uh, it could be, you know, yeah. It just comes out. It's normal vocabulary for me. <laughs> yeah. There's a. It's just another word. It is. Yeah. It's just another word. 
And finally, what is an inspirational or motivational quote that, that you keep close to you to, to connect with? Uh, a friend of mine told me when I first started playing music at 13 years old, uh, he just passed away a couple months ago, but he told me that if you do what you want to do for a living, you'll never work a day in your life. Mm-hmm. And I know that's pretty generic, but... That is something that, you know, again, has been, you know, music is something I would do for free regardless. You know, you have to make money at it to pay for everything. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to do music for yourself before you can give it as a present to anybody else.